Hello. Thanks for tuning in to Fishing on the Fly. This show is sponsored by the Northern Kentucky Fly Fishers. Our club promotes the sport of fly fishing through leadership and participation in educational, conservation, and preservation activities. And we even manage to get in a little fishing. If you'd like more information about local fly fishing activities or about our club, visit this website. This is Tim Guilfoyle with Northern Kentucky Fly Fishers. We have a fascinating program planned for you today. We'll be visiting with Monty McGregor. He's the director of the Center for Mollusk Conservation on the Elkhorn Creek near Frankfort, Kentucky. A mollusk is an invertebrate animal. Lives in a shell like a snail, a clam, or a mussel. Today we'll be talking about mussels. Mussels vary in size from a ping pong ball to a dinner plate. Some mussels live to a hundred years of age. There are over 300 species of mussels in the United States and over 80 species of mussels in the Commonwealth of Kentucky. Unfortunately, most species are in decline and some of these animals are the most endangered species in North America. Freshwater mussels have been important to our region for centuries. Native Americans ate their meat and used the shells for ornamentation, for money, and for tools. Freshwater mussel shells were used for buttons in the late 1800s, and that continued until after World War II when plastics replaced that use. Today, freshwater mussels are a part of a multi-million dollar industry where their shells are harvested, shipped to the Far East, and used in culturing pearls. Freshwater mussels have been overlooked, adversely affected by man's activities, and now even illegally harvested. Mussels seem like such simple creatures, but they lead very complex lives. So sit back, don't touch that remote, and I guarantee you, you are in for a fascinating story. This is Tim Guilfoyle with Northern Kentucky Fly Fish. Hi, my name is Monty McGregor. I'm here at the Center for Mollusk Conservation in Frankfort, Kentucky. This facility is a dedicated facility for the conservation and recovery of freshwater mussels. Uh, we started this facility in uh, Ju June of 2002, and uh, the, we're currently holding about 60 species of freshwater mussels. Uh, the primary goal of this facility is to hold brood stock in captivity and to learn about their life history and behavior and to also try to rear them and eventually release them to the wild. Uh, this is a very, this project is funded a lot by the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, uh, also by Kentucky Fish and Wildlife and other partners as well. These, uh, these tanks you're seeing are uh, small tanks that allow gravity flow to come through from Elkhorn Creek. We've added uh, gravel and sand into our tanks to allow the mussels and substrate to burrow in. They have to burrow to be able to filter properly. And uh, each of these tanks hold uh, several mussels. Uh, the density is what you're seeing is a, is a good density, what you would see in a good mussel bed in the stream. We don't regulate any of the water temperature. Uh, this allows the mussels to reproduce in captivity. Uh, this allows us to learn about their behavior, their life cycle, uh, under what would be considered a semi-natural conditions. The only difference, of course, is we're inside a building. Uh, sometimes we call this a, a river laboratory. This, the drains from these go right back to the creek, and uh, we don't uh, adjust any water temperatures at all. And what we see here is, is the freshwater mussels are displaying normal behavioral activity. A lot of them are, are buried completely, such as this one here. And sometimes they, uh, they will uh, come up on the top, uh, especially during their breeding season. Uh, they'll, they'll change their behavior just a little bit. These tanks are, uh, are small and we're able to keep species from different drainages without allowing genetic crossbreeding between the uh, different river systems. It's a fairly important thing, although it's a simple thing that sometimes we overlook. Uh, we've had several uh, mussels out of, out of about the 59 we have here in captivity. 
we've had well over half of them reproduce in captivity. That's a good sign. It tells us that the mussels are, are being held under are adequate conditions for growth and, and also for survival if they're reproducing. We have uh, several rare mussels here in, in the captivity. In fact, some of them are so rare that many mussel biologists around the country have never even seen them in the wild. Uh, some of them have very comical names. Uh, I'll give you an example of a couple. For instance, uh, here is a rabbit's foot, and it's, you can see it's shaped very similar to the foot of a rabbit, although it's, uh, it's got a very hard shell like all of these mussels have, uh, made out of calcium carbonate, just the same substance that your bones are made out of. Now, these animals tend to lay up on the surface of the water a little more than some of the other ones. This one is called a, a three-horn warty back, and it's because of these knobs that are on the side, if you can see that, they alternate from year to year. This is not a very large species. It doesn't get, get more than maybe a couple, two and a half, three inches. This is a, a pig toe uh, in the genus Pleurobema. Uh, there's several members of this genus around the state, around the country. Uh, it's, it's named that because of the triangular shape that it has, similar to the shape of a pig's toe. Uh, notice also a, a, a little yellow tag on these. Most all of these mussels we have here in captivity have an individual tag that's super glued onto the shell. We have a database that allows us to keep up with where this animal came from, uh, how old it is, uh, how much it's grown over time, uh, when it dies, stuff like that. It's a very easy way for us to determine that. Uh, this animal here is probably on the neighborhood of 20, 25 years in age. And you can determine that from the, from the growth lines. I'll, I'll pick up another one so you can see that a little bit better. This is a, a monkey face. And uh, I showed you this muscle because you can see the growth lines on it very well. Uh, it grows in a similar fashion the way a, a tree would grow, although a tree would lay rings in a circular fashion. This animal grows from the smallest end up here when it's young and adds these annual lines down during the winter months when it's not growing as much. So this animal here would be two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, about nine years old. And you can see the, the, the most of its significant growth occurred in years three and four, it grew when it grew almost an inch in uh, length, in height, I mean. We have some of the rarest mussels here in this hatchery that you'll find anywhere on the planet. Uh, one of the examples of these is called the fan shell. And a fan shell fan shell is a, it's not a very glamorous looking mussel, but it is very rare. Uh, this one here is from the rolling fork of the Salt River system. It has a very uh, unique way of attracting its host fish. Freshwater mussels have a life cycle requirement that they have a, a parasitic stage that has to come in contact with the host fish. Now, some of these mussels have really ingenious methods of attracting their host fish, and this is one example. The fan shell releases a little worm packet. That little worm packet looks just like an oligarchite or a worm that you find out on the stream bottom that you might fish with, but in fact, it's actually loaded full of small, tiny larvae uh, anywhere from 10 to 15,000 on each one of the packets. And so a fish comes along and sees that worm-like packet, thinks it's a worm, grabs a hold of it, and then gets infested on the gills of, of, its, of itself. And that allows uh, that muscle to complete its life cycle. The larvae at that time will stay on the fish anywhere from a few days to several months. It'll drop off the fish. Uh, while it's on the fish, it's uh, metamorphosis is happening. It's going from like the caterpillar uh, to a, a pupa stage, kind of in that format. It's not called a pupa, but it goes from a, a larvae to an, a, a juvenile muscle. Once the juvenile muscle is completely transformed, it drops off, and then it'll start living its life, and it may live, this case, about 20, 25 Here's years. Here's a couple of muscles that get fairly large that live more in the bigger rivers. Uh, this one here on my right is the pocketbook. It, uh, it pretty much is statewide in Kentucky and very widespread in the United States. So on my left is the black sand shell. Uh, it mainly lives in larger river systems, uh, like the Ohio, Tennessee, Cumberland, and so on like that. But these animals get fairly large, uh, even, even quite a bit bigger than what I'm holding now, and they'll weigh several pounds. 
This is a, a pistol grip muscle. Uh, it used to be called a buckhorn, and you can see it's called that because of the rough texture. Looks like the base of a deer antler. Uh, this is a very common species around the state. This is a good example of the sexual differences in the shell shape of some mussels. Not all of them have this. But on my, uh, in this hand, on my right side, this is a male, and on my left is a female. And the main difference is the shape, uh, the, the ventral shape of the shell is, is, stands out on the female and versus the male is just kind of straight and square shape. But this is just a good example of how I know when I pick them up that, that uh, if I'm gonna look for larvae, I gotta look in the female. But I know I had to have the males in there for the fertilization process to take place. And, here, and here's another, another example of a male and female. The male on the, of this species is more pointed and rounded while this one here is almost the si shape of a softball. If you look at them from this way, you can really see the difference in the shape of them. Uh, especially on this end of the muscle. But this is a, a, a species that uses a flap, a mantle flap, as a lure to attract its host. In this case, the host is a bass. Uh, and it pretty much only uses uh, basses, such as smallmouth and largemouth, as its host and pretty much nothing else. Freshwater mussels uh, can bury completely down in the substrate. In fact, they may bury a, a foot or two deep. Uh, sometimes you only see the siphons uh, when you're out looking for them. In a lot of cases, what, on these here, you, you may see a fraction of what's actually in the tank. But uh, they have a, a, a one big foot and allows them to push the foot down into the substrate and pull themselves under. Let's see if we can pull one out and see the actual foot. You can see his foot's withdrawing. He, he withdrew it pretty fast. This is a, a washboard. This is the most important commercial species, uh, at least that's sought after by, by the commercial musslers. Uh, this one here is probably below the size limit that you're allowed to harvest. These animals will get about three times this size, about the size of a dinner plate, and they'll weigh several pounds. Uh, the, uh, and in the Licking River, for instance, uh, the shell quality is not as good because they have some dark bands in them and generally they want a really white, clear band for production of commercial uh, production of pearls. But since they have a black band in their shell, what they'll do is they'll take that black band and, and, and make it into a black pearl. And, uh, and there's a legal market out that's being harvested right now from the licking in particular in Kentucky. They're seeking those uh, uh, black bands in the, in the washboard muscle. There's about four species that are really commonly used as a commercial, but the washboard is by far the more important one as far as the quantity. It gets very large, has a very thick shell, and uh, it's worth a lot more as far as the uh, price. It's, it's not anything to expect. Uh, a, a muscler could come in and collect several thousand pounds in a week very easily. And then, you know, get anywhere, anywhere. It used to be, the, the price used to be up to a few dollars a, a pound, uh, now it's down a little bit, but anywhere from a dollar to two dollars a pound. And if they had three or four thousand pounds, you can see the money in the week could be made fairly quickly. Uh, but again, our resource in the licking is not open to commercial harvest, and uh, that's why they go in there illegally and try to harvest them. What we do, uh, once we, we, we hold the brood stock in our native river systems, in our river tanks, what we want to do is actually then we'll go get the host fishes, and uh, we'll go get those out of the lo local streams and rivers around the state, bring them in. And we generally will hold them in uh, small aquariums and acclimate them to the rear, uh, room temperature. And then we'll transfer them to these, these rack systems that you're seeing here. Uh, the rack systems are, are, are more of a confined area. They have a recirculating system, so the water is not coming in from the river. It's, it's clean water that's filtered, purified, and it allows the fish to be held in their, the best conditions possible. What we do is we'll bring the mussel take the larvae out of the mussel. We do that just using pipettes, something similar to uh, a, a little a simple long pipe, glass pipette. And we'll insert that into the shell of the mussel. Uh, when we do that, we can withdraw the larvae and actually spray them onto the host fish. And we do this in generally in a bucket of water that has some aeration, some agitation. Uh, then we check the fish, fish's gills to make sure that they are on the uh, gills. And we do that by just looking at the gills uh, generally, we'll see some salt-like particles on there about that size. We do that, then we put them into these rack systems and let them kind of incubate for three or four weeks. And then when they fall off, we take them and put them into a nursery system. That's what you see here. 
This nursery system has has uh, a, so its own filter system with some sand and gravel in it. Uh, we actually feed this with our algae that we raise, and then we hold them for two or three months in this system, and then we can put them back into our tanks with the adult mussels, because once they get to three or four months old, they pretty much start eating what the adults eat. They can selectively uh, break down and, and sort particles from the river. This is where we uh, raise our algae, which is the primary food for the juvenile mussels. Uh, we start uh, in a small two liter bottle. Uh, we, we obtain our algae from a University of Texas. Uh, we get them in small test tubes from the university and then we inoculate these, these small two liter tanks. Uh, we add the, the correct amount of nutrients and other things to allow the, the algae to grow. Once they get in here, we maintain these cultures permanently and then we transfer them over to the larger five gallon containers. Uh, these, this dark green algae would, will literally have billions of cells of algae which is needed for these freshwater mussels their first you know, three or four weeks of life and even on the rest of their lives. But we feed them a very controlled diet for you know, three or four months and allow them to get the best conditions they can. These are high in nutrition protein content, carbohydrates, and so on. And we've done a lot of research on what algae are, are good for raising these animals. This is the latest technology in uh, rearing freshwater mussels. Uh, just a couple of people in the country doing this. And what we're doing is we're creating a culture solution out of certain chemicals that we know of and some fish blood. And we're actually putting them in an incubator and allowing the incubator to be the condi replicate the conditions on the gills. In other words, we have to regulate certain carbon dioxide levels and certain things like in the temperature and in the culture of medium itself the muscles will actually transform just like they do on a fish and this, this is very experimental there's not many folks that are doing this or have ever done it and uh, and a lot of a lot of this has never been done with certain kinds of fish blood so so we're we're breaking new ground when we're when we're in this this realm but again it helps us because we may be dealing with an endangered animal we don't know the host we may have one chance of trying to recover this animal and it might be just that we have to go this method. So we're, we're just starting this this spring. It's fairly new, but we got a grant to, to buy some of the equipment, about $40,000 worth of equipment to, just to do this work. So that's why a lot of people haven't done it in the past. It's just kind of expensive. This is a centrifuge and a refrigerated centrifuge, and we have to actually take and spin the blood down uh, in the actual, uh, from the fish to actually concentrate it and remove the blood cells. We, we keep the plasma, which is the clear part of the blood, and the culture medium, but we have to have very specialized equipment for that. Well, thank you for visiting the Center for Mollusk Conservation. Uh, Kentucky Department of Fish and Wildlife Resources is leading the country uh, in this area now. Uh, we have taken a, a group of animals, in this case freshwater mussels, and we've created and dedicated a facility to their conservation and recovery. Uh, it's similar to, uh, we expect people in Africa, for instance, to take care of the lions and the tigers and the elephants. Well, we have the endangered uh, animals in this group, in this country, uh, especially in Kentucky. We have several endangered species of mussels, and we and other countries expect us to take care of them. And so Kentucky is leading that area in freshwater mollusk, mollusk conservation. Uh, this Center for Mollusk Conservation now is in its, almost in its third year of development, and uh, we're really excited about the potential we have for uh, recovering endangered species, also preventing additional species from being listed as endangered. And uh, we've gotten a lot of support. In fact, uh, we've had a tremendous uh, support from outside the agency and outside the state. We have had several hundred visitors come, a professional biologist from all around the world. Uh, we're working with other agencies, universities, zoos, and uh, private organizations to do this effort. It's definitely a team effort, and uh, it's gonna require a, a huge group of folks conservation oriented to accomplish this task in the future. So we hope you've enjoyed the process of learning about how we raise freshwater mussels and a little bit about their plight and conservation needs. And we're hoping now that you can use that and go out and tell others that we need to continue doing this work for a long period of time. So the next time you think about a mussel, whether it's a deer toe or a rabbit's foot, think about the conservation of these animals. Uh, we also work with deer, we work with uh, other animals as well. Rabbits, we manage all wildlife species. So the next time you see a deer or a rabbit, think about the freshwater mussel and the conservation needs. I'm Monty McGregor with Kentucky Fish and Wildlife, and I hope you've enjoyed this show and this tribute to freshwater mussels.
We hope you enjoyed meeting Monty McGregor today. There are many reasons why freshwater mussel conservation is important to anglers. First, many rivers and streams in Kentucky have primarily mud or silt bottoms, and therefore mussels form the primary habitat for the spawning of fish and insects. Second, mussels are siphon feeders and help remove particulate matter from the water and help keep our waters clean. Finally, mussels are pretty tough characters, and when mussel populations begin to decline, you can be sure that water pollution is on the rise. All of us need to be concerned about the quality of Kentucky's waters. If you have questions about northern Kentucky fly fishers or about fly fishing in general, call the number on your screen or visit our website. Our website has uh, uh, tremendous information uh, on club activities, uh, links to other interesting websites, and we also publish our monthly newsletter there as well. Make sure you register in our guest book. We'd love to hear from you. And if you have a suggestion for a future show or something you'd like to see, let us know that as well. Please remember to protect our resources by practicing catch and release, and take a child or a spouse or a friend fishing with you. So long and good fishing.